All right, welcome everyone to today's uh, CMTC seminar. It is our great pleasure today to have Xiaogang Wen from MIT. Uh, Xiaogang probably needs no introduction, um, but uh, he actually did his PhD in string theory at Princeton um, and then switched over to condensed matter um, at UC Santa Barbara afterwards. And um, is of course now well known for seminal contributions to a wide range of topics in condensed matter, especially in topological phases, the concept of topological order and um, enormous contributions to symmetry protected topological phases, entanglement in condensed matter, all a wide range of topics. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about categorical symmetry, a key to understand gapless states. So thank you very much, Xiaogang, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Danny. Yeah, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to give a talk here virtually, not in Maryland. Right? <laughs> um, the, so today I'm going to talk about uh, categorical symmetry and its application uh, to understand gapless uh, states. So uh, there is a three kinds of uh, many body uh, state. So there are three kinds of quantum matter. So first kind is a uh, trivial which is, uh, means you have an energy gap. So there is no, uh, no low energy uh, excitation. So such as the insulator, superconductor. Because at the low energy below the gap, there's nothing. So therefore it is a trivial. And uh, the, the next one, which is a little bit more complicated, which we do have a gapless excitation like in superfluid or the crystal like a phonon, okay. But here we all have a finite number of low energy mode. So those are still manageable. So we call them uh, simple. So those are, those are simple uh, case. And the third kind of, uh, is, a, uh, is a something like a metal. Uh, we say it's complicated. And uh, let me say, okay, the Fermi liquid is a very simple. Why you say complicated? Because uh, this Fermi liquid have an infinite number of low energy mode. So that is make it actually uh, very uh, unusual, at least in few three sense. Okay. So the topology order is a is a is a case where we have a trivial uh, state of matter, because the topology have energy gap. And in the last thirty years, and we have make a lot of progress. So because they are kind of trivial, so now we can have a systematic understanding and even classification of this topology order, okay. So, uh, so 30 years ago, the, the, you know, the quantum Hall liquid and the things like that, it's strongly correlated the insulator are thought to be very complicated, it's a mess. But uh, after 30 years effort, now those kind of thing looks, uh, became more clear, have, a, have a structures. 30 years ago, uh, we don't dare to work on the gapless system. So now uh, we probably can, can really answer this big question, how to systematically understand and classify the gapless quantum states. But when you have even number of low energy mode, it's a hard. So let's do the simpler one. So let's work on the simple gapless states. So how to understand simple gapless states. Here by simple, I mean, there's a finite number of uh, uh, linear mode. So basically, basically some, some kind of conformal uh, field theory. And there are some hope this kind of simple gapless states probably uh, can be understood uh, systematically. And uh, so here we will try to uh, uh, provide some kind of uh, uh, effort or some kind of a proposal, uh, try to uh, go, move in that direction. Okay. So we will consider study a simplest a simple gapless state, uh, which is a critical point in the icing model. So here we consider transverse icing model, a quantum icing model. So we have one dimensional Hamiltonian. We have a, a, a ferromagnetic interaction and uh, this uh, external magnetic field. Okay, so there is a spin flip Z2 symmetry in this icing model. And uh, so we are also, uh, in this talk, we also restrict ourselves to the symmetric subhebra space. So at the moment, it looks like that is unnecessary, and uh, but later we will see uh, this is uh, can be important for for a technical reason. 
So there's a two way to look to view this critical point, which appear at one h equal to j. Okay. The first way is that uh, we start from a symmetric states in a large h limit where the spin are polarized in x direction. Okay. And then the extension are spin flip, but because we are restricted to this uh, symmetric subspace, so we only have an even number for uh, spin flip. And those uh, spin flip are denoted uh, by as an E, which have this uh, fusion rule. So the two spin flip can annihilate became ground states. And uh, this, uh, this Z2 fusion rule implied there's a mode two conservation of spin flip which is actually is a reflection of a Z2 symmetry we just talked about a moment ago. You know, as we decrease this H over J, then there's a more and more spin flip. And then we have a condensation of spin flip. And that's led to the spontaneous Z2 symmetry breaking. So basically we get this a, a phase diagram and there's an icing critical point is right at the transition. So those are very typical, uh, uh, way to look at this uh, icing model grid point. And there's uh, another way uh, to look at this grid point is that we start from the symmetry breaking states. Okay. In a symmetric sub subspace, the symmetry breaking state is a superposition of all spin up plus all spin down. Okay, that's happened when H is very small. And the extension are even number domain walls because uh, the main wall always have a two end, so the domain wall number is always even. So, so the domain wall is a state like this. We have two domain wall again have a, a symmetrization here. We denote domain wall as using M, and they also have this Z two fusion rule. Okay, so that really means that the domain walls have this mode two conservation. Okay, there's a mode two conservation for the domain wall, and uh, there's a Z two symmetry. But this Z2 symmetry is a different Z2 symmetry because this uh, is associated with the domain wall conservation. So this is a new Z2 symmetry is called a dual symmetry. So that is one of the major player in this talk. So therefore we also have a, we can also view vaccine model from this uh, a dual picture. And so there's a, uh, there's a phase diagram, uh, this uh, Z2 tilt symmetry, this uh, dual symmetry uh, may be symmetric uh, in, 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 this, uh, uh, in this phase. But as we increase this H, then the, uh, we have a more and more uh, 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 this uh, uh, domain wall extension being excited, and they will eventually condense, perforate, and condense, and uh, this spontaneously break this uh, dual symmetry. And uh, so the so the so we have this diagram for large H, we have a spontaneous breaking phase of the dual symmetry, and this spontaneous breaking of the dual symmetry actually happened to restore. The original Z2 symmetry. Okay, so that's a that's kind of more or less a standard uh, stuff. So, so therefore, uh, when you look at the two picture together, and we see that the critical point really touch this critical point touch this uh, Z2 symmetric phase, also touch this uh, Z2 tilt symmetric phase. So, so in a sense. This is a critical point have a no, uh, uh, this is no uh, spin flip condensation, nor a domain wall condensation. So in some sense, this critical point would have a both Z2 symmetry and a Z2 dual symmetry. Okay. So this is a, a, a wonderful proposal that is a critical point have both symmetry. And uh, this is, uh, uh, we try to say this may be a, a most important character of the critical point, okay. So, so because uh, these uh, these uh, both these both symmetry are important, so we want to put them together, and then we call this uh, categorical symmetry when we put them together, okay. It really means the following: the system as a Hamiltonian have this uh, categorical symmetry, but uh, however, the ground state may not, because uh, like in these states, the ground state may break part of a categorical symmetry and uh, here the ground state break in the other part but however at a critical point the categorical symmetry is not spontaneously broken so therefore uh, we have a categorical symmetry 
And the critical point happened to be a state which maintained a full categorical symmetry. Uh, other states on the side a break part of the categorical symmetry. So this is basically the hint from the icing model. You say maybe this is a way uh, to look at the critical point. Maybe this way is a better way to look at the critical point. Okay. So, so now let's uh, study this uh, uh, categorical symmetry a little bit uh, further. We ask, what is the transformation of the symmetry? So what is the transformation of a symmetry and a dual symmetry? It turns out that to really study the transformation uh, together, it's important to introduce so-called a patch symmetry operator. So for example, for the ordinary Z2 symmetry, the patch symmetry transformation is really defined like this, which is a product of the spin flip, but only on the segment from I1 to I2. Okay, so only on the patch, not, not, on, not, not on whole chain. And this is already enough for us. So actually, this, I think this is a very important and useful concept. Because our Hamiltonian is a sum of a local operator. And then, so we, we only need to define what is a symmetric local operator. And the symmetric local operator is defined as the operator which commute with this uh, patch symmetry transformation. But we require that the location of the operator is far away from the boundary of the patch uh, operator. Okay. So if a uh, if uh, if operator commute with a patch operator when they are far away from the boundary, then those operators are called the symmetric local operator. And the symmetric Hamiltonian are just some of the symmetric local operator. Okay, so so this way uh, to this this maybe a better way to really define uh, symmetry. So I have a quick question, Chokam. Yes. Uh, so are in this whole formalism when when you make it more general, are you going to be assuming that the um, symmetry has an on-site generator in the model in question always? Yeah, in this case, uh, the, yeah, I think symmetry have a look uh, is onsite. Uh, but uh, for the non onsite symmetry, I think this is also okay. You can also define the path, you can also define this way because we don't care about the boundary. Okay, yeah. so the ambiguities at the boundaries won't matter. Yeah, in actually, the patch operator, this is a very good question. The patch operator have a ambiguity. As a boundary, you, know, you can assign a boundary operator to, his, uh, to a patch operator. Yeah. And but this do not affect your symmetry. Yeah. And Thanks. we have not studied the patch operator very carefully, very systematically. Your question is really good. You know, actually, for non onside symmetry, like for anomalous symmetry, the patch operator have uh, some behaviors. Maybe I will, I will mention that uh, in a moment. So, uh, so at the moment, uh, now let's try to write down the dual symmetry transformation. And uh, the reason we introduce the patch operator is really trying to write down the dual symmetry operator uh, transformation. And uh, in this case, we need to go to this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, dual, uh, uh, dual representation. And uh, there's a uh, uh, there's duality transformation uh, we try by, by, by using this, uh, uh, a dual variable, which is a, a spin on the link. So the, in the dual model, the spin live on the link. So we have a duality mapping uh, from the model to the dual model through this. And the, the dual model have the same form. And in this dual, in the dual model, uh, clearly we see that uh, there is a Z2 tilde dual symmetry. Okay. And their patch operator is really the product of this, uh, it's a Z tilde. Okay, and uh, if you if you look at the duality transformation, you can convince yourself that uh, this is this is exactly the symmetry uh, associated with, with the domain wall uh, conservation. This is two conservation with domain wall. Okay, and uh, so there's uh, nothing special, nothing surprising. So everything looks normal. But what is first surprise that the original Z two symmetry transformation. When you're written in a dual model, became something like that. 
we already have an empty bulk. The bulk is trivial. We only have a boundary operator. So in a sense, in the dual formulation, uh, the origin of these two symmetries are trivial. And uh, that looks strange, but actually it's uh, okay. It really means that uh, in the dual formulation, any local operator in the dual formulation are symmetric under the original Z2 symmetry. So therefore, that's why in the dual formulation, we don't have a constraint to the original Z2 symmetry. And uh, it's a trivial transformation. Okay. So therefore, so that's why we want to introduce the patch operator, because now when we introduce the patch operator, we can really uh, write, write down two transformations explicitly. You know, one looks non-trivial, the other looks trivial, but actually uh, they, are, they, they both are non-trivial. Okay. So to summarize that, uh, the transverse arithmetic model have uh, this uh, Z2 symmetry described by this patch operator. And uh, the Z2 dual symmetry, again, is described by this uh, patch operator, which have an empty bulk. Again, it's empty bulk. And in the, in the dual formulation, we have a similar thing. But now the Z2 dual symmetry looks like a non-trivial transformation, but the original Z2 symmetry have empty bulk. Okay. So, so this is a way uh, to represent both symmetry and the dual symmetry uh, explicitly by using the patch operator. And here I want to make a comment that this, uh, these are two, two versions of icing model are equivalent only within this symmetric sub space. Because duality transformation requires this uh, symmetric uh, sub Hilbert space. So basically, that uh, the two models actually are not equivalent, they have a different spectrum. But however, if you limit yourself within the symmetric sub Hilbert space, then uh, then two model, the spectrum of two models in the subspace are exactly match. So there's an exact uh, duality. Okay. And this explicit expression also allow us to see that the patch operator for the dual symmetry actually create a pair of a charge because Z is a, is a charge creation for this symmetry. So this is a pair, a pair of a charge creation, pair of a creation of Z to a charge. And this is Z is also the other parameter. So therefore, the patch symmetry operator for the dual symmetry is actually is a pair of other parameter of the original symmetry, and vice versa because the patch operator for the original symmetry is actually is a pair of other parameter for the dual symmetry. So we have this uh, this uh, duality relation. Okay, so from here we see that, uh, 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 for example. Uh, in the, for the symmetry, uh, yeah, for the symmetry, uh, there, there are other, the, the other parameter, let me do the confuse. Okay, yeah, here. You know, for the, for the original symmetry, for the original symmetry, uh, this uh, dual symmetry patch operator is other parameter. So therefore, in a symmetry breaking phase, this uh, dual symmetry patch operator have a non-zero average. So basically, that means, uh, other parameter have a long range correlation. Okay, so that's a symmetry breaking. Okay, and uh, in the Z two symmetric phase, and uh, this other parameter have exponential decay. Okay, so for the dual symmetry, is that uh, uh, for the dual symmetry, the other parameter is a patch operator of the symmetry, which have a non-zero average uh, in the dual symmetry breaking states. But however, the, this uh, patch operator have exponential decay average uh, in the dual symmetric phase. So that is, a, uh, that is a, a thing. But from here, you can see that these two other parameters have some kind of exclusion relation. Uh, they, cannot be, uh, they cannot have a non-zero average simultaneously. So this is something pointed out by uh, Michael Levin. And uh, so, uh, so, so therefore, these two symmetry are not independent. So we cannot write, we cannot say that uh, this uh, symmetry is a is a Z two times a Z two dual symmetry. 
if I write this way, the two symmetry will be uh, symmetric, uh, will be independent. But actually, they are not independent. They have a very important relation between them. So, so that's why we write this uh, categorical symmetry as, as a, in this way. So really emphasize these two are not independent in some relation. But uh, what, what is their relation? Their relation can be understood using this uh, uh, symmetry transformation. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, these two operators do not really commute. Okay. And uh, so uh, when you try to commute this operator, there may be minus sign. But however, the minus sign is only appear in one situation. If for the for the Z2, uh, suppose we have a we have a the patch operator is like this. And uh, for the Z2 tilt, the patch operator act on the other segment. However, if these two segments overlap uh, in this particular fashion, and then there is a minus sign. If these two segments do not overlap, certainly uh, they commute. Okay. And this minus sign almost like a mutual pi statistics. So lack of a better name. So we call these two symmetry, this Z2 symmetry and Z2 dual symmetry have a mutual pi statistics. And this mutual pi statistic is a key to lead to this uh, 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 Michael Levin's result. Not uh, these uh, uh, two other parameters uh, cannot have a long-range correlation uh, simultaneously. And, uh, and also it's really say that uh, it's also have a result that uh, uh, for the gap states, uh, one of the symmetry must be broken. Okay, a gap state uh, must break some of the categorical symmetry. Either it break first Z2 or break Z2 tilt. That's a requirement for the gap state, must spontaneously break some categorical symmetry. So therefore, a state with unbroken categorical symmetry must be gapless. Okay. So again, this uh, provides uh, some more evidence that this categorical symmetry maybe is something nice, something you want to extract to study or to understand or to characterize uh, gapless states. Yeah, the, the state with unbroken categorical symmetry must be uh, gapless. So any question here? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I, I can actually ask one. Uh, so yeah. to have uh, an unbroken categorical symmetry, the, if this is if the, ca the uh, category is modular, uh, the, you have to, uh, there can't be any categorical symmetry? Uh, to so very, very good question. Okay. And I, yeah, the answer is yes. And, and today, I'm, my, my talk today is kind of physical version of, uh, of this, on this topic. Uh, next week, uh, I'm going to give, a, again, virtual uh, Zoom talk hosted by Harvard. Um, uh, maybe that's a more like a mathematical physical uh, flavor. Uh, so maybe more, more, more category uh, version of this, uh, of this talk. So indeed, uh, 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 there is a way, th 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 there's a way to use a category to understand the symmetry. And uh, in this case, uh, the symmetry is uh, correspond to uh, degenerate uh, uh, a Bray diffusion category. And the categorical symmetry is like a modular one. It's a non-degenerate uh, Bray diffusion category. So, so there's a, so, so the degenerate and non-degenerate is very important. The categorical symmetry actually is a modular, is a de non-degenerate. So that's also led to these results. Yeah. So this is okay, like so a completion. It's like a completion of the symmetry. The symmetry is a degenerate. You can do the modular ex extension to complete it. And the complete one is categorical symmetry. So that's another way uh, to look at categorical symmetry. I see. So, so if you are just looking at a uh, non-modular or a degenerate uh, category that's describing your symmetry, the statement is that that's not that doesn't fall under the definition of a categorical symmetry. Uh, the categorical symmetry requires this uh, uh, non-degeneracy. Yes. Okay. The one degenerate one corresponds to 
more ordinary symmetry, including anomaly symmetry or anomaly free symmetry. So they correspond to degenerate category, something like that. I see. Thank you. So, uh, so, so here uh, we want to uh, uh, mention that we already mentioned that the categorical symmetry is a is a somewhat since it's a property of the uh, gaply states we can extract. And here I want to emphasize that the gaply states are very special. Okay, uh, why is it special? Because uh, the most gaply states we know have a non-interacting excitations. Those gaply excitations are non-interacting. Okay, so that is special. And uh, since almost all gaply states we know have a non-interacting low energy excitation, we are almost want to say, okay, we can we can say, okay, that's a that's what is what is a necessary condition for gaply states. It must have a non-interacting low energy excitation. And we know that's maybe too narrow. And uh, the critic point is seems to go beyond that. So in the critic point is a more general uh, gaply states, which the low energy excitation do have interaction. But uh, however, we believe those interaction and the RG flow would flow to some very special form. Okay. You know, the original uh, model have interaction. In the first case, the RG flow just flow to zero interaction, okay? And that is a RG fixed point of a gaply states. But maybe this zero interaction maybe is too much. So maybe the RG flow can also flow to some non-zero but a very special interaction, okay? And why I emphasize this very special interaction? Because uh, we know that in the second order perturbation theory, the interaction try to push two level uh, away from each other near ground states. And so therefore the interaction in general have a tendency to open up a gap. And so flow to zero interaction is a way to avoid the gap openings. And to have interaction, which is non-zero and also do not open up a gap, the interaction between different energy levels should be balanced in a very special way. So there's no gap opening. There's some perfect balance. Okay. So that's that's my intuition about the gaply states. So the main Chao point is how is Chao 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 may I ask you a question? Yes, please. It's, uh, this is Shankar. Hi, how are you? Yeah, hi. Uh, this is a very naive question. Uh, the if I think of a regular Fermi liquid, there is of course another possibility that you know very well, uh, yeah. cone lacking your superconductivity, which would have a gap. Where is that in your two items that you have here? One is the non-interacting, that's the basic Fermi liquid. Yes. And the other one is something uh, very subtle and uh, rather, uh, you know, something that you, you, you are asserting. But I do not see cone light in there. That's definitely a possibility, right? No, the, what, what I have in mind is like a critical point, some quantum critical point. The quantum, in the quantum critical point, interaction uh, keep interacting even down to lowest energy. So there's but a the system a, goes superconducting, right? I mean, uh, no. Once it becomes superconducting, is a gap opening. That's right. become a gap. Oh, so, what you're saying that so, possibility is always there. Oh, I it's see always. I'm sorry. It's always okay. there. Oh, okay, so, okay, so that's that is really saying, saying uh, that uh, we don't get a gapless state at the end. I got you know, you at the lowest it. energy, we don't have okay. gapless states. <laughs> okay. What you are saying, if the critical point is gapless, then these are the two possibilities. I get you. You yeah, are not yeah. ruling out the possibility of the fixed point being a gap, but yeah, you are no, saying I'm that's a trivial. Out. You are saying yeah. that's a trivial. Okay, I understand you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a that is a more expected. Actually, you you know, using this uh, general thinking, we would say either we have a gap non-interacting system, or so you have a gap state or gapless non-interacting system. Right, so right. both that's are easy to understand. That's exactly what I was asking. Thank yeah, you. But the gapless interacting system down to lowest energy is puzzling and mind boggling. That's what I try to say. And it's because it's intuition, easy. we really want to extract to understand what is so special about the gapless states. There must be something very special, but what is this special things? That, that is a motivation of this discussion. Okay. So, so actually, uh, another thing to support this uh, special 
gapless states is that uh, usually we have a emergent, larger emergent symmetry at the gapless state. So I mean, gapless state have a more, more features, have a more, uh, more surprise, you know. And uh, so, so, so here I want to make a point that uh, you know, in the icing model, we consider dual symmetry. And the, that symmetry is a symmetry and a dual symmetry. That symmetry is the exact symmetry of the lattice model. But the, however, even emergent symmetry near a gapless system at the low energy, it also have a dual symmetry. So this is symmetry, dual symmetry, really uh, apply for both the symmetry and the emergent symmetry. That's a, a remark. OK. So this really led to the uh, general uh, picture. The symmetry and the dual symmetry together, including possible emergent symmetry and the emergent dual symmetry together. They are not spontaneously broken at the gapless point. And uh, we feel that uh, it is this, this combination of the symmetry and dual symmetry or this categorical symmetry, it is what's so special about the gapless states. OK, so that is a thing. I'm not sure this is right, but uh, at least I, I want to say that that's, to me, right, looks like a right direction, you know. It's a, it's, it's a part, at least I, I feel this is a part of the story. Whether this is the full story, I don't know. A column categorical symmetry to be a full story is a little bit optimistic at this point. But, uh, but uh, anyway, even if it's not full story, we can try looking for more features and make it a full story. Okay. Shagong, I have a question. Yes. Um, do, you, do you need the symmetry to be finite or discrete? Or can categorical symmetry in, include continuous symmetries? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And uh, I'm, I, I'm hoping to say yes. But uh, because I'm using category, so mostly I study this uh, finite symmetry. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I don't see. Uh, the limitation. So the continuous symmetry should should also be fine, and uh, so that would be more interesting. Uh, certainly, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting thing to do. So today I'm only talking about a very simple IC model, and it looks like it's just it's old stuff, and we try to look at the old familiar things from the new angle, basically. And uh, so. So because the categorical symmetry is important, so we want to get a, a deeper understanding of a categorical symmetry. OK. And this deeper understanding, again, is kind of surprising. Actually, categorical symmetry live in one higher dimension. OK. And uh, this reminds me this uh, the famous story, this uh, uh, Plato's cave, you know. And the prisoners see the projection all their life, and that's that's that is what's what is reality. Well, that's all they have. But those kind of projection is kind of like a symmetry. So it turns out those a symmetry actually is a shadow of something in one higher dimension. So it's kind of like this, and uh, so so this cylinder is is more like is like a categorical symmetry. Okay. And the one projection is a is a symmetry. It's not very clear. Here, another projection is a dual symmetry. Okay. So that's a that's a way to see symmetry and a dual symmetry. And uh, so actually, the symmetry of dual symmetry we talk about is a projection from something one higher dimension. And what are these things in one higher dimension? Actually, uh, Daniel already asked this question. It's actually the module tensor category, or it's a topology order in one higher dimension. So let me just uh, uh, tell this story. So there's a way to understand symmetry or categorical symmetry from uh, uh, topology order in one higher dimension from this from this uh, holographic point of view. Okay. So let's consider this uh, uh, two plus one dimensional Z2 gate theory. Okay. And uh, it have uh, this uh, four kind of uh, extension, which is uh, also called a Tor code. This is a null extension or trivial extension and a Z2 charge 
Z2 vortex or Z2 flux and their bound state, which is a fermion. Okay. It's kind of strange that the Z2 charge, which is a boson, and the Z2 flux is a boson, their bound state became a fermion. And this is possible because of this, this Z2 charge, Z2 vortex, have a non-trivial mutual statistics, which is a mutual pi statistics. Okay. Okay. So, so this is the kind of a, a topology order in one higher dimension. And this Z2 gauge theory or topology order or Z2 topology order have a gap the boundary. Okay. And the one gap the boundary is induced by this uh, M condensation, this Z2 vortex condensation, like this red means it's a condensed M. And then, then the Z2 charge move to the boundary is, uh, is not condensed, so it became a non-trivial boundary excitation. Okay. And this Z2 charge on the boundary uh, uh, would have this uh, Z2 fusion rule. Okay. So this Z2 mode 2 fusion rule really correspond to this uh, Z2 uh, symmetric phase, uh, Z2, this Z2 symmetry and Z2 symmetric phase, okay. And uh, so we see that uh, this, uh, this uh, mode 2 conservation of the E particle, Z2 charge, uh, really have this uh, bulk correspondence. That is, uh, the bulk also have a Z2 charge. This Z2 charge on the boundary can be linked to the bulk, which also have this uh, uh, Z2 uh, mode 2 conservation. So therefore, this, uh, this Z2 charge really have this uh, encode this Z2 symmetry, okay. And similarly, this, uh, uh, this Z2 gauge theory have another boundary. It have another boundary. And this boundary is coming from the E condensation, okay. And this E condensation certainly break the Z2 symmetry, but however, they do not break the, the dual symmetry, okay. And the M is, uh, is uh, not condensed on the boundary. And this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Z2 fusion of M particle indicate uh, this boundary uh, have this unbroken, uh, have unbroken this uh, Z2 dual symmetry. So therefore this Z2 dual symmetry we did study before also can be promoted to the bulk. So therefore this uh, bulk uh, have this uh, 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 Z2 dual symmetry called Z2 tilt dual symmetry. Okay. So we can see that uh, this uh, Z2 symmetry, Z2 dual symmetry we talk about can both be promoted to the bulk, okay? And we can see them in the bulk. But in the bulk, we clearly can see that these, uh, these two particles have a non-trivial mutual statistics. So therefore, charge of Z2 symmetry and the charge of Z2 dual symmetry have a non-trivial mutual statistics. So that's indicate that these two symmetry are not independent. There are some special relations between them, okay? So this is a, uh, uh, so this is a, uh, 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 the, the picture of Z2 symmetry and Z2 dual symmetry. And using this picture, we can all also ask following question. What if the, the bulk particle is not boson, but like a semion? Then this uh, semion to the boundary can also become a, a some have Z2 fusion rule, and also is some kind of Z2 symmetry. But however, this symmetry corresponds to this anomalous Z2 symmetry on the boundary. So therefore, anomalous Z2 symmetry, uh, their charge operator when promoted to the, the bulk uh, have a non-trivial self statistics, okay. And in some sense, uh, we can also say this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, Z2 symmetry, the symmetry, this uh, Z2 symmetry times uh, Z2 dual symmetry also anomalous. We can say so this symmetry is anomalous because uh, the symmetry charge of a first Z2 and the symmetry charge of second Z2 have a non-trivial mutual statistics. So whenever you have a non-trivial statistics or mutual statistics, then the symmetry is anomalous. So we can also call this, uh, this, uh, this two symmetry as an anomalous symmetry. Uh, but there are some other consideration. At the moment, I feel this is a bad name. And so, so we, 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 not, we are kind of not emphasizing this point. So we don't call Z2, Z2 tilt as an anomalous symmetry, but we call them a categorical symmetry. Uh, because categorical symmetry is a more general way to look at the symmetry. Uh, in this framework, anomaly just looks like a not so natural way uh, to look and classify uh, symmetry. Okay, so this is a basic uh, a picture of, a, 
of the categorical symmetry is really uh, uh, from one dimensional higher. So, uh, so in a sense, this uh, this uh, categorical symmetry is really just a uh, uh, literally equal to topological order in one higher dimension. And this statement is more general than the uh, uh, modular tensor category because this is statement applied to all dimension. So in higher dimension, uh, the topological order is no longer associated with the modular tensor category. Okay, but it's a it's a, it's, a, it's topological order. So categorical symmetry almost is another name for topological order in one higher dimension. And uh, so it's really uh, uh, this picture really encourages us to, to look at the symmetry from this point of view. View symmetry as a topological order in one higher dimension. Then in under this point of view. Then the, 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 then, the, then the symmetric states, when you say a system with a symmetry became a system that became a boundary of topology order. Okay, so you, you can see in, in physics, we study the system with a symmetry. So under this new point of view, we say, okay, let's study boundary of a topology order in one higher dimension. This will be equivalent to study system with a certain symmetry. So that is really the uh, the point of view we're taking here, and uh, certainly here we have a two gap the boundary. These two boundary gap because of condensation, and we can imagine. Suppose we have another boundary which uh, uh, E and M, they are not condensed. Both of them are not condensed, and this boundary has to be gapless. So there is a gapless boundary of this uh, Z two gate theory, and this gapless boundary uh, can be obtained by by trying to move change one boundary to another boundary, you know. And in the process, if you are lucky, you get a continuous transition, then the critical point do not have E condensation nor M condensation. So this critical point is what we want. So, so therefore, this gapless boundary of Z2 topology order is, uh, uh, is, is have, this, uh, uh, have this full categorical uh, symmetry. OK. So therefore, this. Uh, this uh, Z2 symmetry breaking uh, critical point is a gapless boundary of a Z2 gate theory in one higher dimension. And this statement actually is uh, generally true. That is, uh, uh, if you replace a group to some other group, so when you have this uh, uh, G symmetry, and the G symmetry breaking critical point corresponds to a gapless boundary of a G gate theory in one higher dimension. So this is just another way uh, to look at this, uh, understand the critical point. Okay. So, uh, so therefore, uh, so the, under this picture is that uh, this uh, in one plus one D, uh, this kind of uh, Z2 cross, not cross, Z2 V, Z2 tilt categorical symmetry is really equal to this uh, uh, Z2 gate theory in one higher dimension. Okay. So in general, so this is a general statement. In general, every symmetry have a dual symmetry. So this is just a duality mapping. So every symmetry imply a dual symmetry. Okay. And we denote the dual symmetry in this uh, weird form uh, because this dual symmetry in higher dimension can be higher symmetry and etc. cetera. And uh, if you put this uh, symmetry, dual symmetry together, they form a categorical symmetry. So this is uh, this one way to understand the categorical symmetry. But this categorical symmetry is actually is a gate theory in one higher dimension. Okay. And the G symmetry breaking point is a is a gapless boundary of a, of this a G gate symmetry where the gate charge the gate flat do not condense on the boundary. Certainly, uh, the, the the symmetry breaking point is a gap at the boundary of the of the gate theory. And uh, so, so this, uh, this, this is really uh, some kind of general uh, picture uh, for the uh, for the symmetry and the, and the topological order in one, one higher dimension. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, is do you have an example of two theories with the same symmetry but different categorical symmetries? Uh, yes. So one system with this symmetry. Uh -huh. Analysis that the second system had this symmetry, <laughs> then these two symmetry would have the same categorical symmetry. And this question really led to the following thing. So these two symmetry will be due to each other, 
the argument really is the same thing. No, no, but those are two. Those are two theories with different symmetries, which have the same categorical symmetry. I mean, two theories with the same symmetry but different categorical symmetries. Oh, two theory with the the same theory with the same symmetry with different categorical symmetry. No, oh, okay. uh, this is a uh, uh, this is actually very important. Okay, so let let let, let me let me uh, let me state. Uh, Expand on this question or not? Suppose we have one system with a G symmetry. It's led to a categorical symmetry we call the C1. And we know that the system with a, the dual, dual system would have this G2 the symmetry. And in this dual, the dual system, we may find this system may have another categorical symmetry, C2. If C1 not into C2, we are in trouble. So that, that is really the, the, the non trivialness of your question. And uh, so it turns out that uh, the C1, C2 is the same. And this is related to the, uh, to the issue is that uh, the, uh, so, so somehow the boundary uniquely determine the bulk. Okay. So somehow this symmetry is like a boundary theory. And this boundary theory uniquely determine the bulk. So there's no two different bulk gave rise to the same boundary. And this is very important. Otherwise, the whole thing would have fallen apart. So this is a uh, this is a, we call it this a holographic principle of the topology order. The the ball is uniquely determined by its boundary. Uh, Organ, then could I ask a follow up question to what Mesam asked? Yeah. Uh, your answer, I think, is very clear, but I want to make sure I understand it. So, yes. are you then saying that if the symmetry is defined? That would imply a unique categorical symmetry. Meaning that's right. Yes. Okay, that, is that the statement? Yeah, that statement. Okay. Is that an is that a conjecture on your part, or is this something uh, you can kind of show? <laughs> uh, it's a very strong statement, and I I uh, believe it's a very strong statement. To yes. physicists, I would say I can show that. To the mathematician, I say it is conjecture. No, no, I'm a physicist, but but you have reasonably <laughs> compelling arguments. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty not, compelling not rigorous argument. arguments, but not rigor, and not exact argument. argument. Yeah. You know, there yeah. is a difference between rigorous and exact. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, in some sense, uh, uh, your question also raises an issue that you know the symmetry imply dual symmetry, imply categorical symmetry. Then we don't need the categorical symmetry because the symmetry already carry the full information. That would have been my next question. That why, yeah, we, why, why we need the categorical symmetry? We don't need that. So I agree, we don't need that. So basically, when you do numeric simulation, you implement the symmetry is enough. You don't need to implement categorical symmetry because that's automatic. Okay. And however, this uh, uh, at the moment the categorical symmetry uh, is a uh, Maybe useless, okay. Uh, but I feel it's a useful, so I'm selling this here. <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a theoretical way to view things. And uh, and uh, and we feel this. Uh, we I feel using this angle, we can see more. Although the symmetry already have all the information, symmetry already have imply all the structure, but uh, but we don't see things clearly uh, from that angle. But, uh, but if you're using view things from categorical symmetry angle, this angle is helpful. So at the moment, I would say this is theoretically more helpful. It's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's really this picture. It's really this picture. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is uh, the symmetry is a square, dual symmetry is a circle, but actually they are the cylinder. And, uh, but uh, in some sense, you'll see, you, 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 you see more actually. <laughs> But those are really very good questions. And how useful it is, I will see, uh, as things develop, we will see how useful this concept is. Okay. So now let's come to this uh, uh, one of the main points, uh, one, one of the main application. So we are hoping this uh, categorical symmetry can determine gaply states. So actually that's the whole motivation. We want to study, extract, the special feature of a gap states. And we are hoping the categorical symmetry maybe represent all the special feature. 
fully characterize the special feature for gaptic states. If we believe that, then we can derive the property of gaptic states from categorical symmetry. So that is a, uh, uh, so we try to make this use. And, uh, but from this uh, holographic point of view, uh, we say that uh, uh, this, because categorical symmetry is equal to topological order in one higher dimension. So this question became how to determine, uh, you know, the gapless boundary from is a topology order in the, in the bulk. So how the topology order in the bulk determine is a gapless boundary. So it became this question. And to really answer this question, uh, we need uh, data to describe topology order. We also need the data to describe the gapless states. And then we can ask this question more concretely by saying how the two set of data are related. Okay. So the, so the data to describe a topology order uh, can be obtained uh, 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 can be uh, can be obtained from wave function overlap, uh, which is a, a modular uh, transformation. This ST matrix. So in two plus one D, it works. In higher dimension, this is still a uh, uh, issue. Okay. And this uh, ST matrix, uh, there's a many way to explain that. So the easiest way to explain this ST matrix as a data for topological order is to use wave function overlap, and this universal wave function overlap. So what is the universal wave function overlap? First, we consider a torus, okay? And the torus have a degenerate ground state if the uh, topological order is non-trivial, okay? And then what is the S matrix is that uh, we consider the overlap of a two wave function uh, by this uh, uh, 90 degree rotation. So the S matrix is really 90 degree rotation. So we change the coordinate by 90 degree rotation and do their overlap. Remember that our system on the torus do not have a symmetry of 90 degree rotation. There is no symmetry. So therefore this overlap is tiny. Actually they are exponentially small. The exponents like error time divided by some kind of correlation lines. And so that's like error law part, okay. However, here we claim that uh, uh, the constant part, which do not depend on error, which do not scale with error, this constant part is universal. It's very much like a, a topological entanglement entropy. The error law part is non-universal, but the constant part is universal. For the wave function overlap, we have a similar structure. And uh, that's isometric. For the T matrix, that is a thin twist. So that we have we have this shear deformation, which usually this this shear deformation is not a symmetry. So we can deform the wave function by the shear deformation and consider the overlap. Again, we have error law part, which is not universal, but however, the there's a universal part. Okay. And this 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 defined ST matrix, which is a uh, 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 which characterizes the topological order, which is data to describe topological order. Let me just skip this. Then how to understand this different general ground state on the torus? Actually, there's a way uh, to understand why we have degeneracy on the, on the torus, okay, for topology order. And uh, so we can consider space-time. Uh, a space-time evolution is descri described by a three-dimensional uh, manifold, okay. And the boundary of a three different manifold is a, is, a, is a space, which is a torus. So boundary is a torus, okay. So we can imagine the torus can be boundary of a, a space-time manifold. So this space-time manifold actually is described uh, evolution from the Big Bang. And from the Big Bang, which is a single point, evolve into our space, and which evolve into a, a, a particular ground state on this torus. And in this picture, we can see that a different choice of a, a uh, three-dimensional space-time, which have same boundary, may evolve into different ground states uh, on the boundary. We may have a different uh, uh, ground state. In particular, we can choose our space-time to be cylinder, uh, to be a solid torus, and, and the surface of solid torus is our space, okay? And this different space-time is obtained by inserting different world line of onions in the middle of a solid torus, but they never come close to the to the boundary. Okay, and this so there from here we see that a different onion type 
uh, water line of anion in the space time gave rise to different degenerate ground state. So therefore, we can label the degenerate ground state using the anion in the bulk. So there's an anion basis. And the ST matrix we studied before is, uh, is really the ST matrix in this anion basis. So that is a, a, a some kind of standard uh, a description for a topology order. So now let's come to the data to describe gapless states. So what is the data to describe gapless states? And, uh, and one important tool to study gapless state is to use a partition function. Okay. And usually the partition function only contains this part, you know, there's a trace of a uh, uh, Hamiltonian a time erosion operator in the imaginary time. Here we add a little twist that uh, we allow that uh, as after time evolution, the space gets uh, shifted uh, by delta x. Okay, so we have this uh, 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 shift uh, translation. And uh, so then this partition function will depend on the temperature under this uh, shift. We can combine this uh, the translation and the temperature together into a complex parameter, which we call tau, which describes a shape of a one plus one dimensional space time in a one plus dimensional gapless system. And the partition function depends on the shape of a space time, which carry more information. And this, uh, this, this is not just arbitrary uh, function with tau. It's uh, because uh, under shear deformation like this, you know, we'll deform a square into this kind of a uh, shape. Uh, these two shapes differ by a coordinate transformation. Their partition function should be the same. So therefore, we have this kind of modular transformation of a partition function, modular invariance of a partition function. And uh, so there's, a, again, there's a ST matrix, uh, a ST transformation, modular transformation for the partition function. It turns out that uh, this modular invariant partition function it's a normally free condition, means uh, a gapless system on the lattice automatically produce modular invariant partition function. So these modular invariants are normal, are normally free condition are related. Now, uh, in the modern picture, we, we know that uh, the boundary of the topology order actually is not anomaly free. They are anomalous, okay. It turns out that uh, this, this anomaly is very special. Uh, it's not only uh, they are not modular invariant, it's that the anomaly theory even have a so-called multi-component partition function. So the partition function no longer a number, so that, that's the thing. If you want to study the gapless boundary of topology order, uh, we have to use partition function, which is not even number, which is a vector. The reason to see this is falling. We can insert, so this is a, uh, this, this is a topology order, and uh, this circle is a boundary. We can insert a, a topology extension like anion in the middle of a disk, which is far away from the boundary. So therefore boundary is not affected. But somehow this partition function is changed in some way, in some special way. So therefore different anion insertion in the disk gave rise to a different boundary partition function. So that's how we get a multi-component partition function. And this way to obtain multi-component partition function, after that, you, know, you, can, you can still define partition function using this, using boundary extension and the boundary momentum, you can still define partition function as usual. But this kind of partition function with multi-component transform covariantly uh, under modular transformation. It's a modular covariant, okay. And this modular covariant partition function, this modular transformation gave rise to the matrix. So this boundary ST matrix, okay. So that's the data, this boundary ST matrix is data to characterize gapless states, which have an anomaly, okay. So now you see that uh, uh, we can answer the question. So how the data for topology order and the gapless are related? Well, both are described by ST matrix and these two ST matrix are equal. So, so those are, uh, so that's the setup. So we can obtain this relation. So for example, for the Z2 topology order or Z2 gate theory, they have four type of onions, okay. And uh, there are the four, four ground state degeneracy and the four, uh, these are four degenerate ground state transform like, uh, uh, like this. And this is four by four matrix under this module transformation. That's for the ground state for the topology order. 
And similarly, their gap, their, their, their gapless boundary also have four component of the partition function, okay, associated with onion type. And uh, these four partition functions should transform accordingly, like uh, using using this uh, uh, boundary ST matrix, which happen to be equal to bulk ST matrix. So therefore, the boundary partition function transform under this bulk data, this bulk ST matrix, okay. So therefore, the key is that uh, we can use this bulk ST matrix and this, uh, this uh, kind of modular covariance condition to derive this uh, partition function and to determine the boundary, gap, gapless boundary. So this is a program. And this program is uh, difficult. But however, in one plus dimension, it's doable. In higher dimension, we don't know. This is the uh, main bottleneck for higher dimension. Otherwise, this same program works in any dimension. But however, in one plus dimension, we have this particular pro property. The partition function in one plus one dimension have this uh, uh, special decomposition. Uh, they can be written as a purely holomorphic function of tau and a purely anti-holomorphic function of tau. And uh, with the several of them, the finite number of holomorphic function and the finite number of anti-holomorphic function and the glue them together using some matrix and uh, this uh, partition function have this uh, general uh, feature, and this uh, holomorphic function is called a conformal character, and uh, which is uh, basically known. We have a big table of conformal character, and uh, then so therefore this condition became very powerful in one plus dimension. Combined with this uh, conformal character, this form, we can determine the partition function solely from this uh, ST matrix. I believe a similar thing also happen in a higher dimension, but the, the mathematics is not there. We don't have the mathematics of holomorphic function and this is decomposition, but I believe something similar is there, but we don't know what is this. And that is the main uh, bottleneck uh, for higher dimension. Um, sorry, may, may I ask a question? So, yeah. I mean, if, if the boundary is not anomalous, this label i, does it take the different type of uh, uh, critical points that we may have in the boundary? Yes. And uh, so I, I will come back to this. And certainly from this condition alone, we cannot determine this uh, Z uniquely. We can combine that Z with any uh, anomaly free partition function. That also will be a solution. So there's an ambiguity here. Okay. But I will come back to this ambiguity later. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe I'll just uh, a few more minutes, I, I will finish. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's, that, that's basically the main, main, main idea. So in one plus dimension, using the ST matrix and the modular covariance, and we can solve this equation. And we find for the Z2 topology order, one boundary, one solution is this solution, using this uh, conformal fuel theory of icing character to construct this one. And we can using this uh, minimum model can construct another uh, solution. And so therefore there's another uh, gapless boundary. And this boundary have a minimal central charge is the most stable. It turns out this one don't have a, a, a don't, do not have this relevant operator. So it's the most stable one. And this one actually turns out they have a relevant operator is the less stable. So it's kind of multi-critical point with Z2 symmetry. Okay. So, so the multiple solution is uh, okay, but it's just a, uh, a multi-critical point. Okay. So, but, but from this multi-solution and from the, from the, the question, we can, uh, we can see that actually the, the categories they do not uniquely determine the gapless boundary. And uh, there's a multiple uh, choice. But uh, here I want to introduce a notion of a maximum categorical symmetry. The reason is falling. You know, this solution have a categorical symmetry. This solution have a same categorical symmetry. But actually the second solution have a larger symmetry. Actually, I think this, this solution have a Z3, S3 symmetry, actually, emerging S3 symmetry. If I remember correctly, this will have emerging S3 symmetry and uh, or maybe some, something like that. And so, so they have a larger, they have emerging symmetry. So, so, therefore, so therefore, although these two, these two models both have a, same categorical symmetry as an exact symmetry, but they have different emergent symmetry. They have different emergent categorical symmetry. 
So maybe this uh, emergent categorical symmetry is a uh, 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 is is a key. So we have to because the doublet critical point always have a emergent symmetry, and we should use a Categorical symmetry associated with the emergent symmetry to characterize this gapless point. And uh, this uh, maximum emergent symmetry would give rise, give us this, uh, uh, give us uh, this uh, maximum categorical symmetry. Okay. And uh, as an example for this, we notice that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, for this kind of categorical symmetry, they are described by this uh, little topology order in the book. But we have this uh, EM particle, we have, we have EM exchange. Okay, it turns out that the icing model, icing critical point where E and M do not condense, have this EM exchange symmetry this, as emergent symmetry. Because if one of them condense, certainly this EM exchange symmetry would be spontaneously broken. But if uh, none of them condense, this EM exchange symmetry will be preserved at the boundary. So actually this, uh, this, uh, 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 this solution is not, uh, this Z2 categorical symmetry is not maximum categorical symmetry. We should include EM exchange. Once you include EM exchange categorical symmetry, then the, the, the categorical symmetry, including ZM exchange, including EM exchange, will be the double icing topology order in one higher dimension. Remember, the categorical symmetry is a topology order in one higher dimension. Oh no, there's a double as it's a B there. So so it's a really, uh, 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 so we have this, uh, uh, we have this uh, double icing model. The double icing model categorical symmetry actually is a maximum categorical symmetry for this solution. Okay. And uh, in this case, the boundary, uh, 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 the, the gapless boundary would have a nine component partition function. Uh, it's labeled by H, H prime. H, H prime have a three choice. And so therefore this, uh, this, this, this very simple form of a partition function is a, is a, is a, is a, is a Gapless boundary with a maximum categorical symmetry. Okay, so therefore the real proposal is that this emergent maximum categorical symmetry may be fully characterize uh, the the simple gapless state. The simple means uh, conformal field theory with linear dispersion relation and the finite number of modes, and hopefully uniquely determine uh, those gapless states. So this is the proposal. Uh, maybe we're missing something, and uh, but. Uh, but I feel that this uh, emergent categorical symmetry is an important part of data uh, to carry through the, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, program. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I should uh, really stop here. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, Shadang. Yeah. And so let's uh, open up the floor to any more questions. Shagun, may I ask you a simple motivational question from yes. your very first slide? This is really, uh, I mean, your talk was you know, very, very good. So yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, uh, the point is that uh, you are, you motivated us by talking about Fermi liquid. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, you did not use the word Fermi liquid, but that, of course, is your item number three. Okay, you do have Fermi yes. liquid. And, yes, and, yes. Uh, and you know, I think of myself as having done Fermi liquids all my life. You know, many hundreds of papers on Fermi liquids. <laughs> yes. I believe I understand. Walter Cohn told me that he feels exactly the same way. That Fermi liquid is some. You know, it, it's a it's, it's a problem where you ask me to calculate anything, I can calculate the property. I, you ask me to calculate anything, I can calculate. Of course, I'll do perturbation theory or some other, some other well-defined technique, uh, but this seem to work. Uh, yes. and, and they give you experimentally measurable properties. And it's one of the few areas in condensed matter physics. Um, you know, only other subject that's better than Fermi liquids in terms of our predictive power is quantum electrodynamics, where we locked out because the, power, the perturbation um, is very, yeah. very important. Yeah. So why should I worry about all the things you're telling me? Of course, I know why one should, but yeah. I'm just trying to be dramatic to challenge yeah. you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can predict everything almost. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Thank you very much. Why should I worry about your categorical symmetry? Yeah. Since I'm not, so, a, I'm not a mathematician, right? Yeah. Sure. 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 Let, let, let me ask. This is a very good question. So I should answer this. Let's start from the first one, the trivial one. 
Well, we don't need to worry about that because I have energy gap. So the nothing at the low energy. So, so we don't worry about that. Now let's go to simple one. Simple one indeed have a low energy station. And why should I worry about the categorical symmetry uh, for this one? And uh, the answer is no, we don't need to worry about that because those, those low energy stations are non interacting, like in a superfluid, in a crystal, the low energy mode, like a density wave, the phonons, they don't interact. Then we don't need all this uh, fancy stuff. We can, as you said, we can compute everything. Just like Fermi liquid, we can compute uh, all the property of superfluid, all the property of a phonon crystal, you know, everything. And we don't need the categorical symmetry. But however, in this simple case, we already have a, a motivation. That is, a, at a quantum critical point, we have some kind of a, 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 a gapless system, which are simple, but not simple in the sense of uh, uh, extension are non-interacting. They are simple in the sense their heat capacity are finite. They are, only, and they are, finite, they are finite number of low energy mode as reflected by heat capacity. But those low energy modes are interacting. They never non-interacting. So, so this is a problem. Then we don't know how to understand those, uh, those uh, gapless system. Basically, yeah. we can this under the gapless system without quasi particle. So this is the main thing. The gapless system without quasi particle, this is a hard. And uh, so the categorical symmetry is designed for for the second one. And the third one, we also have a two situation. The gapless states with the quasi particle, which is firm liquid, then we don't need anything fancy. However, we don't know, actually, this is what we don't know. Do we have a, a metallic states with the infinite number mode, but the gapless mode have infinite number mode, but they are no quasi particle? You know, there are people, uh, there's a lot of study to say this thing may exist, but they may not exist. So, if this, uh, if this uh, infinite number mode do have interaction, have no quasi particle, then we need something fancier. But something is beyond the categorical symmetry. But however, as you said, if, the, if our metallic states are well described by non interacting quasi particle, then we don't need anything uh, fancy. Okay, so, thank you. Actually, actually, this is a really important question. That's a, what, do we have a metal with no quasi particle? And I think this is the open question. Uh, okay. I, I think you gave a very good answer. I, I, agree yeah. with, I agree with the whole motivation. Could I then ask a simple question about item two? Because that's yeah. a very good point you make that really categorical symmetry could be very powerful for things like superfluid crystals. And I, I now understand what you're saying. I even agree with you. For example, if I want to understand, for example, thermal expansion, you know, to understand thermal expansion, yeah. you have to allow the phonons to interact. You know, if you if non-interacting yes. phonons will never have thermal expansion. Exactly. So, there are, so I, I, I can see the motivation. I can also see what you're saying about item three. If any of these strange metals or non-quasi-particle behavior, all these things have any truth. I personally think they don't, but if they do, then the way you are looking at it is much better because you are saying it's not mysterious. We have to understand the categorical symmetry of the problem. You know, instead of waving hands and saying everything is strange, we have to do some hard work, and I, yeah, I accept yeah. that. Okay. Very good answer. Actually, actually, really, really, a very good question. You know, phonon always non-interacting at a low energy. As, it, as the energy goes to zero, interaction also goes to zero. But on the other hand, do we have some crystal or maybe liquid crystal where the fluctuation of phonon is uh, large and the interaction are important? Or maybe some quadratic uh, phonon dispersion have this property. So that would be, that would be some kind of quantum phonon gas where interaction do not go to zero at a low energy. And that would be the situation. We need something uh, fancy to study. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I understand. I now understand. Okay, I was puzzled, but you have explained it very well. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Hello? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, right. So, so back back to the back to the metal case. So, 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 why did you say it's still open question whether there can be a metal without quasi particle? I thought I thought uh, at least uh, we have a. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, uh, probably it's not open. Uh, maybe there's example. Uh, the, uh, probably um, let me put it this way. I'm hoping this uh, this uh, the, the 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 critical point of a metal without quasi particle is the one with a finite number of relevant operator. 
I did not really follow this, but I, I don't know whether this has been shown or not. Maybe you should. Uh, say again. Maybe fi fi uh, uh, finite what? Can, can you say that again? Finite number of relevant operators. I believe if you allow infinite number of relevant operators, such state exists. But uh, with a finite number of relevant operators, uh, whether this uh, thing can exist or not. You mean whether it can be a stable R IR fixed point? Uh, yeah, the, with only a finite number of uh, unstable direction. You need okay. to find tone, find a number of uh, parameter to reach this critical point. Or do you need to find tone infinite number of uh, parameter? I thought I thought for all the studies of uh, like like uh, like uh, uh, metal as the quantum critical point would not be qualify. I mean, would not qualify as a uh, critical point with a finite number of relevant perturbation. And uh, and I think all the studies uh, at least suggest that's an example of a, of a non-formal liquid without quantum particle. I see. Yeah. Uh, the the, the things are like. A for example, like uh, this uh, superconductor, and uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like a marginal critical point, uh, like Fermi liquid, I'm sorry. The Fermi liquid is an example, which have an infinite number for uh, uh, relevant direction. Sorry, they have, they have infinite number of conserved quantity. Uh, what do you mean infinite number of relevant? Uh, infinite number for emerging the conserved quantity. Yes. But those emergent conservation can be explicitly broken at high energy. And whether those explicitly broken would uh, repair itself at a low energy or not. No, I, I think Shankar RG, Shankar RG shows that uh, the uh, infinite uh, number of conserved quantity will emerge in the IR, which means that uh, uh, explicit breaking. Yeah, I, yeah thank you. Yeah, remind me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, now, now, now I see, I remember this. Uh, you need to uh, break a uh, central reflection symmetry. With the central reflection symmetry, there's always a uh, superconducting instability. But if you break central reflection symmetry, uh, the, yeah, the Fermi liquid critical point is probably stable against the uh, uh, weak interaction. Uh -huh. Yeah, and also, also, also have another have another maybe question, maybe common. The, so, so right now it seems like uh, once we have a spontaneous symmetry breaking of this uh, categorical symmetry, the uh, system is no longer necessarily, no longer necessarily have a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that's actually a, a stark contrast with the ordinary spontaneous symmetry breaking, though. Like, like, like when you have the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of the dual icing symmetry of the IC model. I mean, yes. the system is no ground state degeneracy, but that's, that's actually very uh, different from ordinary notion of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yeah, uh, this is a, I, I don't, maybe, maybe let me one thing, uh, I just point one thing. So it's very important to study in a symmetric subhaber space for this, uh, for, whole, for, for the whole picture to work. So therefore in a symmetric subspace, the symmetry breaking state have no degeneracy. Okay. So therefore, the uh, uh, so therefore the 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 the, the symmetry breaking and the symmetry restoration and the critical point uh, in the symmetric subspace uh, have a slightly different way to look at it. So this is why we can put the symmetry the model and the dual model at an equal footing, because within this symmetric subhaver space, uh, the model and the dual model are kind of uh, are really uh, exactly correspond to each other. And uh, this, uh, this uh, restriction to the Herbert space is very important. Actually, this is the mo what the motivates us to consider type of categorical symmetry because when you restrict to this uh, symmetric uh, sub Herbert space, the total, this, this Herbert space no longer have a tensor product decomposition. That's a sign of a gravitational anomaly. So the idea is that this uh, symmetry restriction of Herbert, sp Herbert space is a breaking of a tensor product decomposition and from this breaking of a tensor product decomposition, you can encode or you can extract the symmetry. So this is a categorical way to look at the symmetry. And uh, so basically, uh, uh, what I talk about today is uh, using this kind of a uh, 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 picture. So therefore, this uh, restriction is uh, pretty important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Shogun, may I yes. ask you a question? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, first, uh, I have a comment. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of uh, inter interacting phonemes. I think, oh. yeah, uh, I know uh, an example, although I'm not an <laughs> expert on it. Namely, right. the <laughs> solid, solid uh, uh, hydrogen or possibly solid uh, uh, helium under pressure. Oh, I see. Okay. They become, yeah. So uh, in the usual literature, they say, they claim that uh, pho uh, phonons uh, in those cases are the so called nonlinear phonons. I, I think nonlinear phonons just means uh, uh, what you guess that that's the interacting phonons. Oh, right? okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, yeah. That that would be another example of a gaplet system with an interaction, no 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 quasi particle. Right. Maybe yeah. The, the structure trans if there is a continuous structure transition like in a liquid crystal, you, you you may have this situation. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh another one uh is a uh question. So I feel that uh, your uh what do you call that as the uh, Categoric uh, symmetry, at least uh, in the uh, two plus one dimensional case or one plus one dimensional case, yes. uh, are related to the so called quantum double or the center of the category. Yes. Is yes. that right? Yeah. So, uh, right. what will yes. be the exact uh, statement using, you know, quantum double or the center of the category? Uh, it's this. Uh, in general, uh, the symmetry are described by their uh, representation. Okay. Right. Uh, in any dimension, let's say in any dimension, the, the symmetry charge, your representation of symmetry, that's a point of particle. Okay. And then okay. There, is a, there is a categorical way to describe a symmetry. Let's say this, uh, this symmetry charge from a representation category, which actually is a higher category in higher dimension. <laughs> okay. So there's some kind oh. of representation category of a symmetry representation, which is really described as symmetry. Then the center of this uh, category, this, uh, this uh, we call the symmetric fusion category, uh, mm -hmm. will be the uh, one higher dimensional uh, Brady fusion category. And that will be the categorical symmetry for this symmetry. So therefore the whole thing can be formulated using the category language. Okay, uh, then uh, do we know uh, some example? I mean, concrete example, which uh, realizes uh, uh, categorical things. Yeah, in, for the, the, the dimension. Yeah, for, I mean, for the finite symmetry, for the finite symmetry, this Ising model I studied can be directly generalized to a higher dimension. The dual symmetry, which I, I did not have time to talk about, it's a it's become a higher symmetry. And if the symmetry group is not abelian, the dual symmetry is even beyond the higher symmetry. And it's something we start we not we have not studied before. So we call this a algebraic higher symmetry. The okay. algebraic higher symmetry is studied in one plus one dimension in terms of a non-invertible defect line. Mm -hmm. uh, but in higher dimension, uh it's a uh, something new. Okay. And uh, so this is really, uh, uh, yeah, the, the whole thing is a very, become very mathematical. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole mathematical framework to, to describe this, yeah. When you talk about uh, uh, higher algebraic symmetry, uh, uh, do you need to go beyond the so higher category theory or not? No. Uh, it's a, it can be formulated within higher category theory, but I need to go beyond the higher group. This algebraic higher symmetry is no longer described by higher group. Okay. So so that's why we gave a new name. All right. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thanks.
Uh, could I actually ask a question? Um, yeah. Does this uh, categorical symmetry, uh, is it useful for, or does it distinguish gapless phases from critical points? Yes. And uh, so, so maybe let me tell one example, uh, which is a, I don't have time to talk. And uh, there's a, a well-known uh, uh, example where the Z2 gate theory or this uh, or, or Z2 topology order here. And it can have a phase transition going to this uh, trivial phase. Uh, but this transition can be go through the Higgs condensation. This Z2 gate theory is a three plus one dimensional Z2 gate theory. Through Higgs condensation, you can go to trivial phase. Or through the flux loop condensation, you can also go to the trivial phase. So there is an issue that when, like these two transitions, Higgs transition or flux condensation or confirmed transition, are they the same, uh, same transition point? And we know that the flux condensation really is first order. But however, if we fine tune it to make it a second order transition, do we get the same critical point or not? The answer is no. Because of this, uh, uh, this uh, Higgs transition have this kind of categorical symmetry. And the flux condensation, if there is a critical point, will have a different categorical symmetry. And uh, so, so therefore, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, if this confined transition is a, is a, we make this into a continuous one, uh, we will have a new critical point, uh, then the Higgs transition. The Higgs transition is a usual uh, Z2 center breaking transition critical point. So this critical point is the same as a uh, icing class, a 3D icing, a 4D icing class. And, but this one is a new class, if you make it a continuous. So that's, a, that's a one uh, application, I would say. Yeah, we need to find a more non-trivial application like this. Sorry, I, I, um, the, where is the gapless phase here? The, these are, this is as distinguishing two different critical, critical as points. A yeah, there's a two different critical points, one from confinement, another from a, a Higgs condensation, but the confirmed transition is the first order. So there's mm -hmm. no gapless point. Sure. And here we say, if we fine tune parameter to make a confirmed transition a continuous, whether this continuous critical point will happen to be the 4D icing class or not. I see. I guess the, 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 the answer is no, it's not for the icing class. I see. I guess the question uh, maybe I can ask um, is, it do, if I were to look at something like a Lunger liquid or, um, you know, in three plus one dimensions, U1 gauge theory, um, does uh, categorical symmetry give any additional or useful perspective on why those phases are gapless? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, in some sense, yes. And uh, so that really means the uh, if the phase has to be gapless, that means the, the bulk top large order uh, depends on no gapless, uh, no, no gap the boundary. Right. And uh, actually, uh, uh, one thing is, uh, I think uh, for, for this double summon uh, top large order would have a similar thing, that uh, the double summon top large order uh, do not admit uh, gap the boundary. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, and so that means okay. if you do not break symmetry, then you have no gap boundary. Can't you condense the boson from double semi? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a boson there. Uh, okay, yeah. There's one gap the boundary. There's no other gap the boundary. Right. Let me put this way. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so you need you, you need a, you need some example where you have certain symmetry and who's a, who's a topology that do not admit any gap the gap gap the boundary then. Uh, we know we know that uh, this kind of thing exists. So that that will be the uh, that will be the uh, thing which you have one D system. You you have to have gapless uh, uh, face. Thanks. All right. Are there any further questions? If not, let's thank Xiao Gang again for an excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah. There's many questions. Yeah. Very thank good you very talk. Much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.